one of the problems that you guys struggle with the most is funding your game development journey. Because of course, making games is all fun, but you still need to eat, unfortunately. We still haven't figured out like photosynthesis and usually that requires money. And how do you get that money as a game developer? There's plenty of ways, some are good. Most of them are honestly quite bad. So we figured in our traditional tier listing format, we're going to be going over all of them, giving us your thoughts, because most of them at this point we have like interacted with in, or at least I've talked to people who have actually gone that path for like in development. All our opinions, please don't murder us in the comments, but you can comment. And I think we should start with the one that probably most of you guys have considered, but that I believe isn't really that great as you may think. And that is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding through Kickstarter or Indiegogo really, where the concept is simple. You have an amazing idea and maybe you have some art and you know, you make a crowdfunding campaign. You're like, hey, this is my game idea. This is like some very early prototype footage that I have. I'm asking for $50,000. There are a lot of games that have successfully done this or are currently doing it. I think the main one like that I still think about every night basically is Star Citizen. 10 years into like crowdfunding already, they've gone like very extreme already. But there's also plenty of indie games that try to get started. Um, I think Earth of Orin. There's, there's a few, I'm gonna put B-roll footage of some games that have been like gone through crowdfunding or somewhat successful. But in the meantime, I wanna spend a bit of time why I don't think it's a good idea. You already need an audience. Yes, so that's something, the biggest misconception is, oh, I'm just gonna put up the Kickstarter page and the Kickstarter algorithm is going to feed people towards me. Not gonna happen. Whereas I think there is a stat that I think only 20% of all backers are found organically through Kickstarter. And then the remaining 80% you basically have to supply yourself. Another big trap. Well, there's multiple actually. The first one is how do you do rewards? Because often, you know, you get the money, but especially if you do physical rewards, like, oh, I'm going to send you a poster or a print or like even like I've seen like mini figurines of our game. Those things cost a lot of money. Shipping worldwide is like a crazy amount of like both time and money investment because you have to figure out how the local laws and everything work as well. And in the end, there's even like, I've known of some developers who basically have lost money on their crowdfunding campaign because they set like a price for a physical good that wasn't enough to really even cover the good. And then they had all the other benefits they had to do as well. Another problem is also, you can't just make a Kickstarter page and put it up and then forget about it. The money will start rolling in. You need to like actively have a full on community campaign basically. That's also part of the, you know, 20% only comes through Kickstarter. You need to have like constant updates, make like in between like trailers, have like Discord servers that are very engaged because you need to get an audience that will like advertise for you. That is gonna be like, oh, I found this really cool game on Kickstarter you should also back it. So yeah, that's generally why I'm not the biggest fan. The idea behind this is really good though, because also Kickstarter is not, you know, if your game fails in the end, okay, you'll have disappointed, people will probably try to refund, but it's not like you're gonna lose your house over it. That's a very big thing. It is more flexible in that regard. Also, your audience you already means that you have a core audience. So your game has a bit been validated already that, hey, I'm not making garbage. Whereas, you know, if you make something that nobody really wants and then you put it on Steam after two years of development and nobody buys it, well, that's a problem. Kickstarter can be that first like beat to get it started. Often you get some marketing around it as well, so. He already said a whole lot. I don't really have a lot to add. Yeah, I just went on like yeah, choo-choo train. Sometimes he rants. But yeah, I, I agree. That's also one of the reasons why we didn't do a Kickstarter because we see a lot of drawbacks in it. If you are just making your first game, like most of you are, uh, as far as I know, don't do it. It's not the way to go. Yeah, there are definitely, if you have like an established funding and maybe like a publisher has pulled out suddenly, but you have that community already, then look into something like Kickstarter. It can be worth it then, but honestly, I would have put, put it right now at a D tier maybe even. Agreed. Okay. I was thinking C or D, but I yeah. can definitely see a D. I'm, I'm not sure I'm because, you know, we also have to think about the future things. Maybe I would put this as a C tier, actually, just because that's like a good in the middle. We can go up and down from there as well. Yeah, yeah I guess, like I said, C or D is both fine by me yeah. because there are definitely success stories and it is possible to do it. It just when you are just starting out, it's probably not the best way. We also really front loaded this tier list because that brings us to our second one, which is publishers. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're not pulling any punches, it seems. Okay. Um, once again, I feel like publishers are overrated, okay. but also underrated. I'm going to let you do the rant otherwise before I go on for seven minutes okay. again. So an opinion that 
I think we both share because that's how we were invited me at least is people think publishers are free money. They are not. They are like a bank. They give you like a hundred grand up front, but you need to pay that money back. And once you have paid that money back, unlike a bank, they say, okay, now it's like 30% is for us. And it depends on your deal, of course, but you always keep paying them. Of course, they give you the, the runway to develop your game. But I think a lot of people that are just starting out are not best suited to go to a publisher right away. Yeah, they have this dream of, you know, once I get a publisher, my indie game is going to be a success. Because fund publishers, one big difference with a bank loan is they do also support you, or at least yeah. that's what a good publisher should do. Problem is, there's a lot of garbage publishers out there as well. We've been approached by a few for Forge Industry as well, but it's like, you know, they make very crappy games and it's more, you know, very aggressive contracts really, like where they get, you know, you get an upfront payment, but then once the game is released, they have like usually 80 or 90% revenue splits. So like every game you sell, like 90% goes to them to recoup. And then after that has been recouped, then there's still like more that you need to pay them, but you just get a little bit more. Some more problems, like I said, it's easy to find a bad one. Now, what do I mean with a bad one? Most publishers have good intentions. The problem is it's a very hectic landscape and you usually get like a producer assigned to you, but every like six months for some reason you get new producers. It's a problem I hear a lot because like people shift jobs, get better pays at other places. And that means that you can't really have the long-term vision that a publisher will like tell you to do. Another problem is publishers can be traditional sometimes. So they'll be like, okay, we'll give you like part of this budget is for marketing as well. We're going to go to Gamescom for like five days with like a massive boot. That costs a lot of money and you're gonna have to pay that back in the end. You can't be like, oh, we're not gonna do that because no, the publisher knows best now. The publisher is giving you the money and you're gonna have to listen to that publisher. Basically, you have to spend the money because you have to pay it back. And if you, even if you want less, you shouldn't be happy if you get like a 500,000 publisher deal because you have to pay that back. Yeah. Of, of course, they do take the risk because I think uh, if your game completely flops, okay, they took the risk for you. So that's nice, I guess, you made something. But if, like, if you start game development thinking your game is going to flop, and that's why you need a publisher, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah, I have a really good example. I was talking with a Belgian developer recently and they had a publisher fund them for 80K. It wasn't like not that crazy big of a game. And they were like, okay, 10,000 euros of this game is going to go to localization to Chinese. And the development studio was like, but we don't really want that. We could, could you just not have given us that 10,000? That's not because they had a very text-driven game that was meant for the English language. And they were just like, okay, could you not have done that? Because now there's just 10,000 that you're going to have to recoup more and it's not going to pay back in the end. Another problem. Uh, these are, hold, hold. These are don't the, go too far. These are the longest ones. Publishers can be dicks. <laughs> And what I mean by that is you'll have like your demo ready and you're going to Gamescom with your Steam Deck or your like pitch deck. Oh, the comeback later. Yes, the comeback later moment. And they're like, oh yeah, this is really interesting. We'd love to like hear more about it. Why don't you work on it for like a little bit more and then come back to us? That's what they often will be selling you. Like, you know, there's always like, oh yeah, we want interest. But they try to stall because stalling is in their advantage because the longer they stall, the more risk you take instead of them. So you have a lot of scumbag publishers that will keep you like strung along really, but don't really have the intention to commit. And I think we recently went to a talk from uh, Jason Del Rocco where he covered this really good. Publishers aren't looking for like a good idea or even a good execution, but they're looking for you in the meantime. They don't want a better game when they say come back later. They want a proven game. So they want a game Validation where Validation from users. Yeah, they want a game where you already have like an early access community for, well, not for early access, but where you- You run play tests, you yeah. went to events, you get a lot of wish lists, some YouTuber covered you. Validation that the public loves what you are making. Yeah. Doesn't matter how good or bad it actually is technically, they probably just look at, is this going to sell well? Because they want to recoup their costs. And they usually don't want to tell you this up front because you know it's kind of a dick move i think those are my main concerns i have with publishers now we do want to make like some really in-depth videos where we sit down with publishers because i know publishers are a really big part of game development so if you're a publisher watching this right now reach out to us um, i do want to go into like learn more about it because we have self-published our games right now and because we have the luxury of this youtube channel and like more like funding streams we'll get into that later we don't really need to deal with a publisher right now it's like something that could be nice but we don't need it right now but it's something that a lot of developers 
it is normal to get a publisher. Also, if you want to go, for example, into a market that you don't have that much experience with, because they do have actual people with marketing knowledge. Yeah. We, we ranted a lot about publishers. They do have good things to yeah. offer. They have a lot of good things to offer, but I feel like a lot of developers don't. It's not the, it's not the savior of all. Getting a publishing deal doesn't always mean your game is going to be great. You, you succeeded as a developer, whatever. It is a good help. It can be a good help at least, but it's not yeah, the savior. Yeah. So that's basically all I had to say about it. I would put it at an A minus or a B with all that I've said. B. Okay. I, I wouldn't put it too highly yeah, because maybe. we we rented for like 10 minutes about how bad they are and then said like for one minute, they are also pretty decent for some things. But that's good. But the reason for that, like I said, is because you know all the good parts about publishers usually because they're good at marketing themselves. You know, they have the good boots, the visibility at like large events. They have the network, they yeah. can give you more people so you can develop faster. But there is a lot of costs, like in terms of, you know, what to do yeah. with the money that's associated with it that not everyone is yeah. certain of. Don't just blindly go into thinking publisher deal is win. Just think about like, a, what is it, a SWOT analysis. Yeah. Next up, and Marx, please hold your horses and don't go too crazy on this one, is the incubator. So what is this? Imagine you're getting started as a studio and someone else gains uh, from the start basically equity in your company, but they do provide other things like a studio, a network, some training, maybe even people, contacts. They do bring things to the table, of course, but from the start, you basically give a part of the equity to them. Yeah, this is something, incubators is something that originated more from the traditional tech scene, really, where it's like, you know, oh, I have this cool software as a service idea. You like rent like a desk somewhere and then they like support you in like making sure you manage your game. I do think that is a pretty solid part, the like supporting part. If you are someone who's like, I just want to make games and that's all I really care about. I don't want to deal with like planning that much or with like the paperwork of starting a company, incubators are really good for that because they take all of the boring stuff out of your hands, really. You don't need to worry about that. Depending on your incubator, the big problem that I feel is money up front versus like long-term gain. Because here in Belgium, we have one big incubator and generally you get about 25 to 50,000 euros when you join it as like your starting fund in exchange for 10% of your equity, which Seems like a solid deal at the first, but... Do you value your company at 250K in five years? That is also true. And also, honestly, 25K, because that's what they usually give, honestly, isn't that much if you're like realistic, because the moment you start hiring people, you have a runway. If you hire one person and you pay yourself, not including like your office costs or whatever, that's a six month runway you have, which isn't that long really. And you'll have this idea of, oh, I have this bunch of money. I can just like get artists and things like that, but you'll find out that it's not really that much in the end and you'll still be stuck looking for more money. I do think they are really good. Like I said, if you don't want to deal with all of that stuff, you just want to make games. And especially if you're like solo developer, maybe one like extra programmer or artist, you can do a lot through it. So I do think they're pretty solid and they also have usually a network to connect you with publishers or other people like that. Yeah, I think they give you a kickstart to your journey. But you, if you think of lo about long-term success, you probably are going to outgrow them. So in th at the beginning, they can give you people in the industry that can help you out. They can help you, with, of course, with the, the money, like you said. So for example, if you're purely coding, like us, and we would have joined them, we could have like get 25K that we could have spent on artists. So. We'd have an office as well, because right now we're just doing it all remote, really. Yeah, the reason why we didn't do it as well is also just because, you know, we're four people. I, we have all like a little bit of a finance background or like, you know, the accounting, like doing, dealing all with the company business. So I was like, I'm just gonna do it ourselves. And also they require you to go full-time. We didn't start as full-time developers. You can't join an incubator as like a part-timer. No, you're gonna have to quit your main job if you wanna join an incubator, if you like, wanna join a real one at least. That is also a very big like thing you need to keep in mind. I would put them at a B tier as well, I feel. I do think they're pretty good, maybe even higher. I don't know, what, do you, what would you say? I don't think they're worse than Kickstarter. Or they are not worse than Kickstarter, but I think they are worse than a publisher. You basically sign your entire company over instead of just a game. That's true, yeah. B minus? Yeah, sure. We, we really suck at tier list thing and where we actually put things. So this is our own creative take on tier list. Sure. Okay, I'm going to promise we're going to start speeding up at this point. I think we've got the main big ones out of the way. I don't know how long this video is going to take. It's way too long, but there is going to be a lot of value in this, I feel, if you're a beginning mm -hmm. developer. If you haven't done that, please subscribe. Maybe I should plug this like more in the middle of the videos. Next up, we have grants, but specifically government grants. 
don't worry, I will stay calm. Okay. We have some experience with this. We've, I have, because, at least I have, because he just has to program. I have looked into three different grants right now. Three different grants, uh, one from Europe, one from the Flemish government. Well, two from Flemish government. One from our Flemish uh, cinema and audiovisual government, which is like a game fund. And then one of the more general Flanders investment and trade, which is more just about exporting. I've looked at all three. We've gone through two application processes and we've got results from one so far. How they work is basically you submit a long document about this is my game or this is my company. This is what I want to achieve. And this is what I need help with. And then you'll have to wait a bit. They'll go through all the documents and they'll be like, okay, hey, you're approved. Here's some money. Or they'll be like, hey, you're not approved. No money for you. Generally, these grants, what makes them really good is they're very lenient. For example, the Flemish audiovisual one, they can give you between 25,000 and in total at most 400,000 euros. And they have a, it would be nice if you could pay us back, but honestly, we don't like, really expect that many people to fully pay us back. So their idea is they're lost in line. So you pay yourself, you like, if you have a publisher, you can first pay the publisher. And then if you still have like some money lying around because your game was that much of a success, if you can pay them back then with no interest would be cool. If not, no worries. So that part is really good. It depends, of course, a lot as well. There are other grants where you don't have to pay them back at all. These are usually a bit lower in like the amount, for, however. The one we had from Flanders Investment and Trade is 9,000 euros, which is you had to spend it on like, going outside of Belgium, basically, for exporting. You don't need to pay that back. You just need to prove that you've used it and you've tried your best, really. And then you have Creative Europe. And that one is, if you have a narrative-based game, important, you can get, after your game has been launched, you can get some money back. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but basically you have to have the upfront investment first before you get the money back. I'm gonna let you speak now because I can keep going on this for like, I think another 15 minutes at this point. Yeah, generally I think, like you said, they are very lenient. They give you a lot of opportunities. The biggest downside that I see, first of all, from what I hear, the application processes are a nightmare. He, he had a lot of fun making those, so I'm happy I didn't have to. But also, just like everything with the government, like imagine your government right now having to pass in a law. Yeah, it takes ages before you get a reply. It, it's just very slow. And it, depending on what kind of developer you are, it can be a good match. Because if you want to make a uh, very big scope, I mean, even if, even if they don't like big scopes, a uh, long runway game, like over three years or something, they can be a godsend, yeah. I think. But if you are looking to move quickly, if you are looking to expand on your game quickly or release a uh, short uh, development cycle. Which short things, we mean like half six year. to 12 months, yeah. really. Half year, a year. Then it's getting a lot harder already yeah. to, yeah, with good conscience say they are amazing. So story time, we applied for the Flemish audiovisual fund. We requested 25,000 euros in prototype funding. I've covered this in a video before. The process to write the entire document took about two weeks. So two weeks, I was just writing out our scope, all of our mechanics, or like I had to like make a planning of this is how we're gonna spend the money. You had to like budget how many hours are we going to be using on art, on like implementing this specific mechanic on UI. All of that has to be spec'd out. It's a lot of work. And then we had to send it off and we had to wait four months. That's a crazy amount of time. In that time, we gained 9,000 subscribers. 90% basically of our audience was gained in that period. We released the game for the industry. We did post-launch updates for that game. We went to various conventions for that game. And only then did we have a meeting with the, the jury where they like spent 20 minutes to look at your application and be like, eh, you get funding, yes or no. We didn't get it in the end because we didn't have artists. So yeah, keep that in mind. They can take a very long time. Uh, some other problems, like I said, Creative Europe, you need to have spent the money before already. So it's only like a year after, like if we had made a narrative game, we could have applied right now for the current open call and we could have gotten up to 50% of our total development cost back. You can factor in your hourly rate even if you don't pay yourself for that one, that's important. But Again, it's a very long file. Like Europe one is 80 pages. It's like nuts. And another problem is with the timings, there's only like certain application windows usually. The Flemish investment one, uh, the Flanders investment trade, there's only two periods a year and you have like a three day window then to apply. And if you've missed it, bad luck. Flemish audiovisual fund is I think three or four times a year that you can apply. And the Creative Europe one is once a year uh, usually. Those things can really slow down your development as well. I do think they're pretty good for certain audiences, because this is probably the closest you're going to get to a 
free money. Even if it's not free money, they are very lenient. So I think they still rate very highly, but it's important to know there are caveats. Yeah. Like, like, while publishers aren't the godsend of all, these can be a godsend depending on your, yeah, on your, how your government works, where you are in the world. And of course, if it aligns with your schedule, then they are amazing. But if it's a bit, yeah, it's very dependent on your timing as a studio, all of those other things, like you have to be willing to put in the time and work. I would put them at eight here though. I can, I can live with that. Also, depends on what country and the region you are. Yeah. If you're in like, uh, I think Africa, you're screwed. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. But if you're in, I think the US and in Europe as well, it's really coming up and becoming more popular to have like game funds. Biggest industry of them all in entertainment. So everyone wants a piece of the pie. Okay, I promise this one is going to be quick. Venture capitalist. <laughs> I'm going to keep this really short. Venture capitalist, if you don't know them, it's basically the same as an incubator, but you get less benefits, but you can get more money. So venture capital, again, is very traditional to regular IT. You have an idea, you do like funding rounds and you say like, hey, I'm selling you 20% of my company in exchange for 200,000. Do you know Shark Tank? It's basically Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, but for games, very like, a lot of like, you know, networking, connections, things like that. You get more money, but generally the projects they fund are also very long scale. So they won't be funding a game, they'll be funding your studio. There's one very big one in Belgium, for example, that is venture capital funded. And what they've done as well, because you need to make money with venture capital, they have a motion capture studio that they can like rent out to other studios. I would put this one at like an E or an F tier. Honestly, I don't think you should engage with them at all as an indie developer. Yeah, there are a lot of risks associated with this one because they can be very aggressive from what I know. Yeah. I would also... This, if this, F tier. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. Like, there's a, such a big risk. There are a lot of better options out there. Like, just look at the tier list. Everything above it is better. Try that before. You, this is your last resort if you really need money. Yeah. Next quick one, <laughs> I promise, is Steam residuals. So this is, you've released a game. I mean, if you have it, just it, then it's S tier. If you don't have it, it's F tier. Yeah. Basically, that's why I often suggest making your first game and actually releasing it as fast as possible. Because the moment you do that, you get access to game residuals. Yeah. So this is- Recurring income. Woo. Passive income or like mostly passive. You've already done the initial investment. You have the product out there. Steam doesn't like require you to pay even if like nobody buys your game. Unlike a like warehouse in Amazon if you do like drop shipping. You just have to pay like the 30% cut and that's it. You do, it's like, we probably are getting some sales as we record this video and we're not doing that much anymore. One thing to keep in mind is probably the amount of residuals you get is based upon how much post launch support do you do, still do and things like that. And also you can like still market a little bit, update the store page from now and then. Generally, I do think this is a really solid way to get a little bit of extra income. You probably won't be able to live of it, but it will supplement your future developments. Yeah, I personally think that if you're starting out as a studio, you probably want to build a backlog. There was once a talk on the GDC, I think, about a guy that just made small games and over time they amounted to a lot and he he was making six figures in a year because of that, because they all like build up, up on, uh, built upon each other, basically. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, this game sold for like 200 bucks a month and this for like 300. And like that, he could pay himself a pretty decent wage because he just had a good backlog. And of course, like the downside is you have to have made the investment. But if you're working right now, for, for example, as a full-time job, I would try, if you can, to just release a game while still working and only then consider uh, going like full-time indie. So where we kind of put them? Honestly, S tier, I think. I think if... I, I can't in good conscience give them S tier, okay. just because you have, then you have to have made eight, it. Eight tier then. Yeah. If you can do it, it's S tier, but just because there's like a high, big step to just... You need to there. have done the first release. Yeah. So if you can do it, it's probably one of the best ways because it's literally free money. Next up. One that I personally have quite a bit of experience with, and that is personal savings. So if you don't know the story, I quit my job, I had a bunch of money saved up, and that's how I've been able to afford being a game developer right now. We're making more money, it's like building up, but I'm still coasting off savings for a while. I think this one is pretty self-obvious, like, okay, the advantage is I know how much money I have, I have my runway set out because I know on average how much am I spending each month, and then I can just coast and not have to worry too much. The big problem is risk. Not that 
getting that saving in the first place. Have you looked at the state of the economy recently? Also fair, I guess. This is more something if you are like, you know, you're like 40, 50 years old, maybe you've got a house. I've talked to some people who they have paid off their house and you know, you can like roll in money. You've been working for 20 years, saved up a bunch. You have like a pretty solid runway that you can actually be like, eh, fuck it. I'm going to make a game like full time for the next two years. If you're like a younglin who's like just graduated, this is no way going to be possible for you. You need to have had a previous career outside of game development because game development pays shit. Yeah, you need a, you also need a backup plan because there's a lot of risk involved. Like what if you quit your job and you have like 50,000 euros runway? Let's just name a number. You work for one and a half year and you release a game, your budget is basically done and your game flops. You just wasted that money, so to say. Like, it's still a big risk, so you can't, I, I can't in good faith put it too high. However, it is a risk, so there are also a lot of benefits involved because- You have you full freedom. That's yeah. the good advantage. Like, I don't have to care about what anyone says. I don't have to care about, oh, are we really, I, am I going to have to like go and talk to publishers? Because right now, I don't. And that is, if you have a game with you need creative freedom, this is perfect for that because you control everything still. Yeah, I agree. It's just a big risk. B tier then, I guess? I can't put it at A tier, I feel. No, A tier definitely not. But, but it is publisher, I, I would put it B minus. B minus? Just below publisher because like, if you can do it, it's a lot better than a publisher. Yeah. But a publisher, while they have a lot of drawbacks, they give you a sense of security. Yeah, B minus, I can live with that. Next up, bank loans. Don't do it. F tier. No, like in all seriousness, if you have to take out a loan for a game. First of all, no bank probably is going to actually give you a loan for game development. I, I really want to see you point. try that one. But even if you would get it, how are you going to pay it back if you fail? Yeah, that's the thing. If you like fail with your personal savings, okay, you can probably just go back to work and it's fine. But if you fail and there's like, you know, a bank that's looming over you. You need to like, what, you're bankrupting yourself, literally. You might lose your house. There's much more risk that way. And honestly, game development, it's fun, but it's not worth like that much trouble for. So I wouldn't do it. I would, I definitely don't do it. Another F tier? I think it's F tier. All right. Now I feel bad for venture capitalists because... I mean, they're kind of the same as a <laughs> bank, except the venture capitalists usually can't come and steal your house. Yeah, that's... Only a small detail, of course. <laughs> like I said, remember the economy. Nobody of our viewers is going to be able to afford a house to begin with. Yeah, relatable, I guess. Okay, it's back on a more <laughs> positive note. Yay. So we talked about the government grants. One other one that's also grant-based is the Epic Mega Grant is a very big one. So more non-government grants, or you also have like some competitions where you can win some money if you're like the best indie game. I think some game jams also have like prize money. Yeah, if you can get it, why not? Yeah, that's the thing. I think especially Epic Mega Grants, if you are an Unreal game, we know some developers that's basically kickstarted the entire career with like one Epic Mega Grant because it's 25K. I yeah, I think it's 25K. But unlike an incubator, you have full control of your company still. Yeah. You have a bit of backing from Unreal, things like that. Honestly, Unity, you probably don't watch this because I don't think you like us. But if someone from Unity is watching us, first of all, answer our email. Second of all, <laughs> sorry. Second of all, why are you not doing mega grants? Like, this is such a big advantage for Unreal, I think. Because Unity doesn't need it. Unity is so, I mean, right now- Right now they need it. They right now they need it. But up yeah. until like, before they decided to like, just burn down the company, <laughs> they didn't need it because yeah. everyone used Unity. Whereas Unreal was more for like, the real like, bigger studios. I mean, so yeah. I think that's where the mega grants came in. Basically Unity, start doing it now. A lot of people don't like you right now. They are looking at Unreal or Godot or yeah. Godot, whatever you call it. Godot. Godot? Godot. Godot. Basically, um, start doing it. That was my call to action, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, and then I, you can also submit your game to like competitions. I think GWDC is one. I don't really like it that much. Or like game jams. I think pretty much this is a really solid way as well to get a little bit. You won't get that much money off it, but it will be like an extra like fun bonus that when keep like give you a bit more runway, give you a bit more also validation of, hey, what I'm doing is good. Similar to how you get a government grant. Usually what you're doing is good. Like yeah. someone has seen it and it's like, this is good work. Tim Sweeney, if you're watching this, 
Probably not. You can also give us a mega grant, but we'll see. We'll see. Oh, oh, no, I'll switch to Unreal if they give us a grant. For the next game, then. I don't want to rewrite every line of code. Yeah, I don't know. I think A tier? Yeah, it, I think it's good. Yeah, it's good. Honestly, it's a very pro move of Epic to do this. I know uh, they get a lot of flag for the Epic Game Store and people don't like it, but don't hate the company. And then a strategy that we are looking into, I guess. Uh, we don't have that much experience with that, but it's something that I've seen a lot of other developers do is community funded development. And that is similar to how a Kickstarter works, but instead of being like a upfront one time big lump sum, you get a constant stream of subscribers, usually through a Patreon or a Ko-fi, I think is another platform where you are like, hey, I'm going to be working on this game. You like make the updates. Randy is a very big YouTuber game dev that I've been following. He ha still hasn't released the game, I feel, after like all these years. He's funny though. But he's funny and he has a similar idea of, you know, you can fund me, you get early builds of the game, you have like more direct contact, things like that. Maybe like, I'll, if you pay me enough, if like, or like 50 bucks a month, I'll make like you as a character in the game, things like that. So it's basically a constantly running Kickstarter. I think this is good, but you need to keep in mind, similar with Kickstarter, you need to become a community manager. And not everyone is ready for that. Especially if you're like Randy, you need to make YouTube videos, you need to be funny. Another thing is, for example, you make like some tutorials or you share some source code, but that's when you go more into the like general YouTuber thing already. You need to have a community that you can convert. And if you're alone, it's a whole lot of work. So if you're alone, it's probably a very bad idea to do this. I think there's definitely value in it. Like, for example, a lot of people also like to be part of creating something amazing. If people believe your vision, they will most likely support you. And if they, for example, back you on a Patreon, they are also more likely to, for example, play your playtests, give you feedback. And that's also a lot of benefit you get from this. While, of course, the publisher can pay a tester to do it. If you can do it for the community that do it for free or because they have passion for your project, it's even better. And I want to quickly take this moment to also shill our own Patreon, which we do have. Since like a few weeks, because as I said, this is something that we have been actually thinking about. And it's like, if you do have the audience, like we did have it, like the point we reached 10K, it was like, okay, we actually have to think about this. Like, how do we not have to sell our soul to a publisher? We are going to try a Patreon. So if you are someone who is like... Loving these videos, loving our games, want to see us succeed and grow because, well... In the end, Mardix will have to have food because like he said, he's... I, I don't have that much savings. It's like always going down. Yeah. But yeah, we do have a Patreon. I'll link it down below. Please support us that way. And if you can't, no problem. Just share the video. Yeah, or just keep watching because YouTube AdSense is still a thing. So yeah, true. I think it's pretty good. I think it's a B tier is what I would put it. You put it above Kickstarter? I put it above Kickstarter. It's more work than Kickstarter. No, I don't think so. No? Kickstarter is a lot of very, you because Kickstarter, you need to make a campaign really. And you have like all the fancy art, whereas- But Patreon, you have to do consistently. Patreon, Always. you need consistently, but the quality can be much lower. It can be as simple as, hey, this is like a little video where I share my screen and I talk in the meantime of, this is the progress that I have been making. This is like a new character I've made for the game, things like that. Whereas. Also, Kickstarter is a lot more risk because once that funding period is over, if you don't reach your goal, you're not reaching it. And then it's like, you can't like keep re-kickstarting your game. Whereas, you know, Patreon, there will be moments, there will be ups, there will be downs maybe, depending on like the closer you get to development or if you make a very cool feature, get put featured mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. But I think you spread out the funding, but also the risk over a longer period. That's true. And now that I think about it, you also, while a Kickstarter campaign runs for like a month or so, yeah. in that month you have to succeed, a Patreon can also grow. Yeah. Indeed. So it even is, if, if you're the only thing. person watching this that joins our Patreon, you helped us out already. And okay, like we might grow on it, hopefully. Your campaign won't fail. Like your, kicks, uh, yeah, your Patreon didn't fail while your Kickstarter can fail. I think you can keep the money anyway with Kickstarter, depending how you fund it, but you convince me. I can I can live with B tier. Yeah, I think B tier is pretty solid as yeah. well. So basically, basically, get a publisher or go... Uh... I don't think community funding is for everyone. No, it's no. a lot of work. Don't do it as if you're on your own. You'll, it's something you'll that too much time. you'll also... You can't start development being like, okay, I'm gonna make this game and it's going to be community funded. It's something that you'll have to see through the evolution of like making GIFs on Reddit or on like uh, Twitter. Yeah. And then like from there on seeing- Like the name suggests, you need a community for community funding. All right, one more and we can go home. Freelance funding. So oh, what this, yeah, work for hire basically, mm. because this is something that we here in Belgium see a lot. Um, that is 
because you know people don't have those savings maybe they have an incubator but they ran out of like the main incubator money it's like okay i'm a game developer or like an artist i work on my game for like two three days a week and then the other two or three days i go and i work for another studio and it's like that way you get some money paid for and then you can like also spend a few days on your main job still and in the end you're still doing five days a week of game development so you don't have to become a waiter or whatever and you can still keep in that industry that you really want to i think it's if you have to it's a last resort yes there are yeah of course you're still doing game dev but i think it will drain a lot of your energy because it's not like oh i'm gonna be spending only 60 percent of my work week on a game on like my own game that you're only gonna get 60 percent of results because your brain will be more drained from it context switching is a thing it's yeah you have to yeah. suddenly switch between like oh my own game and then maybe suddenly this completely different game also finding the freelance work kind of hard right now I don't know if you noticed but like everyone has been laying off like very talented artists at like epic and yeah. such you yeah. have to compete with those as well it can be really hard there yeah if you are going down this route I think another developer from Belgium that I know of that does this what I like about his approach is that he does like six months of only uh, work for hire yeah and then for example he has the funds for let's just also say six months to work on his own game okay surely you are like you're only working half a year on your own game but you at least have less context switching. And you can do that very long yeah. stretch where you have the momentum. Shout out Oscar, by the way, we love you. So if you go down this road, I think that's the best approach. However, if you can avoid it, I mean... I would, yeah, I think it's better that you... I would prefer it if you stayed in your current career first. Get that saving and then go for the savings approach. Especially because a lot of your viewers aren't game devs by trade. You like want to yeah. get into game dev. You're, it's going to be really hard to find work for hire if you don't have... If you graduate, this dev. is good. Yeah, if you've graduated from a game dev degree, then you can do this. But if I was to go to a random studio right now and I'm like, hey, can I work for you for like two, three days a week? They'll be like, who are you? Go away. So it's not for everyone either. How the hell do we rate this? What is this tier list even? I would put it at a... C minus or a, no, a D. I don't think it's great, but it can work for very specific individuals. But for most of our viewers, probably not. For most of the viewers, probably not. You also need to have, be talented so you get a lot of jobs. And you just have to hustle as well to find the jobs to begin with. Yeah, it's also time consuming. And the, the biggest part why I don't like, why I think D is fair, you don't progress on your own game. And if you are an indie and you're not making your own game, why are you an indie? Just go work for Larian or whatever. I don't care. Yeah. Let's put it at D. Okay. So, please, come deep fry our uh, <laughs> amazing opinions in the comment because a lot of you will probably hate it. And I do it. think there is quite a bit of value in this video. I'm not sure. We probably missed a few. These are like the main ones, but I'm really curious. What are you doing to like fund your development? I feel like, honestly, the biggest one we kind of missed was you know just doing it on the side but that's less of the scope because you know a lot of our people they're like having full-time career somewhere else and like I work mean, indie game on the side just say it's self-funded yeah then it's basically self-funded but that's i don't really count this this is really if you want to go more into the full-time indie uh, this tier list because yeah of course doing it on on the side as a hobby project is gonna like make you the most money in the end but yeah i think those are the main ones this is also very rough video for us to make because we don't have venture capital like yeah we've been we have opinions and and venture capitals have reached out to us actually but yeah but also like we have opinions on how we want to run a studio and a lot of the funding weights are actually very personal on how you see your own studio yeah. because the vision of of bite me for us at least I think, yeah, this For is a, me at least. This is a very good story. Maybe when we went to Gamescom, um, Thomas had to listen to me like in the car after the three days of Gamescom. I was like, you know what? We're better than these publishers. We don't need them. We're going to go our own way. Slay He's queen. So yeah, it depends on like for some people, yeah. like publisher is the way to go. We personally, like I, my own belief isn't really that much that a publisher is the way to go. As like I said, if you're a publisher and you want to show me the light, reach out. Yeah, it's a, a personal take. It's also depending on your situation at home. Do you have your, uh, yeah, do you need to pay rent or do you have to keep uh, paying? Do you have children that need to yeah. eat? It, it's it's very dependent. So while we might have rated venture capitalist F tier, maybe for you it's the way to go. Probably not. Who knows? But yeah, anyways, we're game developers, like I said. 
if we've made our own game, we've interacted with a bunch of these ways. If you're interested into running a studio in general more and you know figuring out how do I get funding, how do I make sure that my game's launches are correct, this is the channel to be. So if you go down below and you subscribe, that would really help us out because then we know that you like these kinds of content and we can like make more of it and you get in exchange for that you get these videos twice a week so i do think that we have quite a bit of wisdom already even though we're still a pretty young studio so i just want to spread that with you guys also we have a discord join the discord there are a lot of people talking over there so they might have helped you out and see what is best for you in this situation yeah anyways that's all i think we had to say i'm gonna shut up now before like i say any more like bad statements so thanks yeah, for watching we burned a lot of bridges today <laughs> and we'll see you guys in the next one Bye. Bye.